Hello, welcome guys, my name is Steve and this is Gopher Toots. And today you're gonna learn about a very interesting topic, a topic which is very often overlooked in Go. We're gonna talk about constants and what exactly are those in Go and you're gonna find a lot of interesting details even though you write Go for a while. So let's go ahead and dive straight into the topic. All right guys, so before we jump into the topic, as usual, let me show you where exactly that is on GitHub. So if you open up your browser, you should be able to type github.com slash gophertooth slash gobasics and inside this repo, you should find constants. Inside the constants directory, you have a bunch of examples, you have the presentation and you also have the readme, which explains a couple of things about const, how to run several programs, which we're about to play with in this tutorial and many things like that. So now that I showed you where exactly the repo is, let's go ahead and dive into the topic and talk about those things which I said are overlooked in Go. So there are specific properties which make constants unique and the first one is they cannot be redeclared or reassigned and probably you knew that and that's pretty much it what a constant is that cannot be redeclared or reassigned. Another important thing to notice about constants is the fact that they can only hold scalar values or also known as primitive values in other languages. Another cool property of constants specifically in Go is the fact that they can hold large high precision numbers and we're gonna talk about high precision numbers later on in this tutorial. And another obvious thing is they can be created from expressions, like you can combine multiple constants and form a new constant. And another important thing about constants, which is specific to Go, is they can be untyped or kind. And we're gonna talk about kind or untyped constant later on in this tutorial. And another one which I myself didn't know about until I made this tutorial is constants exist only during compilation time. So I mentioned earlier that a constant value can only be a scalar value. So basically a scalar value is nothing else but a primitive value. So other languages call it primitive values, but in Go they're called scalar values. So the syntax for declaring constants in Go is pretty straightforward and it's pretty self-explanatory. It's just like in any other language. So basically you have the word const and you have the identifier and you have a specific value, but you could also declare it in multiple ways like you could have const identifier value or const identifier a type then a value, or you could also have a group of constants and you could group them using brackets. Speaking of identifiers, they pretty much work exactly just as in any other language. You have a bunch of Unicode letters and numbers, but the first character must be a Unicode letter or it could also be an underscore. So here's an example of identifiers and you could also notice here that we use Chinese characters and that's really not a problem for the compiler because it does UTF-8 encoding before compiling your code. So when you name your constants or variables, you should also be aware of punctuation and keywords which are used in the language and that's gonna conflict with your identifier if you name it that way. So just make sure your identifier is clean and doesn't contain those symbols or those keywords which are keywords to the language. So there's another type of identifier which is specific to Go and that is the blank identifier. So basically the blank identifier in Go is primarily used for unused variables or constants or unused imports because otherwise you'll just get an error. Another use case of blank identifier is, for example, when you have a function and that function return two results, one of which is the error. Sometimes we are very silly as Go developers and we ignore that error. And in order to ignore that error, you just simply underscore it and that's blank identifier. It's basically gonna omit that error. It's gonna ignore that error. And finally, the blank identifier is used for side effects. And what that really means, it's basically gonna call the init function of that package. And we talked about the init function in Go program anatomy tutorial. So make sure to check out that tutorial where I talk about the init function. So basically side effects, it's gonna call the init function, which is gonna do some initialization for us to work. So in our case is the MySQL driver. So when we speak about constants in Go, there are two types of constants, typed and untyped. So basically it's as simple as that. It's as simple as it sounds. Typed means they have a type. Untyped means they don't have a type. And we're gonna have a closer look at typed and untyped later on in this tutorial. So when we talk about specific const types, these are the types a const can take. There is also another special constant in Go called IOTA. And IOTA from Greek really means the smallest letter in their alphabet. And it really means the smallest unit. So I'll give you an example of that in order to make it easier for you to understand. So imagine you want to have bytes multiples or you want to have the days of the week as constants. So how would you do that? You'd probably do const identifier equals value, const identifier equals value, const identifier equals value. However, you could use IOTA in order to make your life simpler. So basically you could just say IOTA for the first constant and the rest of the constants following that constants are automatically going to be filled with values. So in the end, IOTA is nothing else but an integer value. So if you want to check that out, make sure you open up IOTA definition and you'll see it's nothing else but an alias of int. 
So basically IOTA is gonna start from zero. That's why in the first example, we're doing underscore in order to ignore that value because we don't need that constant. And as I said earlier about blank identifier, when we don't need something in Go, we just underscore it and that means we're not using it. Now, when it comes to constants in Go, the operations that are applied between the constants are very, very strict. So basically you can't mix and match types when using constants. In Go, you also have to be explicit about the end result. So basically you can't add a constant of one type with a constant of another type. It's gonna give you an error and you have to be specific about the end result. Basically, you have to do conversion or you somehow have to apply an operation which both types satisfy. Otherwise, it's gonna give you an error. To give you a more specific example of that, let's take a look at the piece of C code. So basically, you have unsigned int u and you have some long values. And you have long signed int, which is equals to one. And later on, you do some operations and you add those numbers. In C, that's totally legal. However, in Go, it's gonna give you a big error. So if you take the same example in Go, it's gonna throw you a big error on the screen because in Go, you have to be specific about your end result, as I said before. Now, if you wanna run that example by yourself and wanna make sure that that is true, let's go ahead and open up the readme.md. So if you open up your IDE or text editor, whatever you got, you should have constants and inside constants, you should have something like C versus Go. So basically, if you open up C, you have the following program, the program which I showed you earlier. So let's go ahead and compile this. So I'm gonna open up readme.md just for the reference and I'm gonna copy the command which compiles this program. So basically, it's gonna say gcc main.c, it's gonna put the output to exec. So let's go ahead and cd into that and compile this program. So cd constant and here we have c versus go. And we're just gonna paste this command which I copied before and it's gonna give you a warning because that's legal, but not so legal. However, if you do an LS, it generated the binary. So let's go ahead and run this binary and boom, it works. So if you run the same example using the Go code, it's not gonna work. That's why we have to be explicit about the end results and we're gonna have to do some conversions. So if you open up main.go, you're gonna have to do conversions, as I said, either convert the first one or convert the second one, but the end result has to be one type. You can't mix and match types just like you do in C, so that's why you have to be specific about the end result, and Go requires that when you play around with constants. So because the Go code is organized in packages, another important aspect to consider is the visibility or the scope. So how does that affect the constants? So basically, it's very important how you name your constants, because if you don't name it properly, you won't be able to use it in other packages. Like, for example, you have a package, let's say P, and you want to use something from that package in the main package. You won't be able to use that if you don't name your constants properly. So that's why there is a convention in Go. Anything that starts with an uppercase, it's exported. Anything else is unexported or private. So you don't need to use any syntax like private or public or protected or underscore the variable name. You don't need all that. You just need to uppercase your symbol, your constant, and that's done. The job is done. You can use that symbol in another package. So basically this rule is applicable for anything in Go, a custom type, a constant, a variable, anything that starts with uppercase means it's exported, anything else it's unexported or private. So it's also good to notice if you export something, it's good to document that because there's somebody out there who uses your code from the outside. And if you export something, a good practice in Go is to document that by having comments. So basically comments are documentation for your code in Go. So to show you an example of exported and unexported constants, make sure to open up your IDE again, you have constants here and then you have scope. So inside scope you have main.go, you have p1 and p2. So let's go ahead and start from p2. So you open up p2, you have p2.go. So inside this file we have an exported constant. Well, it's exported because as I said, it's with an uppercase letter. So then we have p1. And p1, as you can see here, imports p2. So basically when you import p2, you actually have access to that exported symbol or that exported constant. So we say p2.exported inside this init function. Let me actually prove you that that is exported and that's not just a constant which starts with an uppercase letter. So let's open up p2 and let's try to change it with a lowercase. And you might think, well, you actually need to rename it here and it's gonna work. So let's try to rename it here. So we rename it here and it doesn't work. If we try to compile this program and run it, it's just gonna give you an error. So as I said before, exported means uppercase. So you have to uppercase that constant in order to be exported. So inside P1, we use that exported symbol and then we have main.go. 
So inside main.go, as you can see, we import P1 and we have a couple of costs and then we have a couple of prints. So basically here we print P1.export and the same is available for P1. If you go into P1 and you try to, let's say, name it like this and you go into main and you try to say export it. See, it just doesn't work. Let's say export it. Let's try to compile this program. When you compile this program, see, it's, it's gonna fail. It's not gonna work. So basically, this is not how it works. In Go, you have to name everything with uppercase in order to have it exported or in order to have it public if you're used to public private thing if you're coming from another language. So we talked earlier about typed and untyped constants in Go. So basically it's as simple as it sounds. Typed, it has a type. Untyped, it doesn't have a type. So in Go, except the bool and the string types, pretty much every other const is just a number. So basically in the end we have the boolean space, the string space and the number space. So if you check out my tutorial on basic types in Go, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So even though Go allows untyped constants, which means those constants don't have type at the time the compiler evaluates that code, don't you think Go doesn't work with types? Because Go is a type language, it has a type nature. But actually behind the scenes, Go assigns a default type to that untyped const. So here are the defaults for the untyped const. So basically for a bool, you have a bool. For an int, you have an int. For iota, you have int, as we said earlier. For rune, we have int32. And for float, you have float64. And for complex, complex128. And for string, you have string. So I really don't have to explain anything about this. It's as simple as that. There is also such notion in Go as constant overflowing. And as I said before, constants in Go are only available during compilation times. So basically when Go compiles your code, it takes those values and it doesn't place them anywhere in the memory because they cannot fit a float64 or they cannot fit an int64 because they're just too big. So there are specific mathematical values, which by nature, they're very huge and you cannot represent them in a specific type which has a specific size. So that's why you can store them inside untyped const and you can use them later in order to obtain a higher precision result by doing calculations with those high numbers. So let me go ahead and show you an example of that and I'll prove you exactly what I mean. So if you open up your IDE and you open up constants, you have high precision and inside high precision, let's open up main.go. So inside this file, we have huge numbers, numbers like P were huge mathematically exact, which basically are numbers that cannot fit regular types like float64 or int64 because they cannot fit that size. That size is just too small. So it could print this number p, but it's not gonna output the whole huge number. It's just gonna output whatever it fits float64 because that's the default untyped const for the float. It's float64. You, you could also do the following trick to make sure this is right. You could take this number which gets output here when you print p and you could divide it by p. And if those numbers are equal, if the huge mathematically exact number is equal to the number which gets output in float64, then you should get out one. It's not gonna equal to one because these are not the exact same values. This P is larger, it's way larger than this one. So let's go ahead and run this program and check out the output. So as I said, this is the output. So this is a super powerful feature of constants. You could have higher precision results using these mathematically exact values. You don't have to pay anything for that. Go has that built into the language. So I talked before about type conversion and being explicit about the end result. So in Go, when working with constants, there is implicit type conversion and there is implicit by syntax and implicit by type. So let me go ahead and show you an example of that so I don't confuse you with a lot of buzzwords. So again, open up your IDE and you have constants and inside constants you have implicit type conversion. So let's open up by syntax.go. So by syntax really means what it says. So basically when you say, let's say you add some numbers or you do 0.2 or you say hello or you say, I don't know, you add and you another operation you can apply. So basically here you have a longer syntax. So it's gonna take this syntax, it's gonna parse it. And depending on the type priority, which we're gonna cover later, it's gonna assign a type to it. So another type of conversion is by type, as I said. So basically you have a constant and you give it a specific type. You say this constant is of this type. So basically when you do that, no matter what value you assign to it, of course, if it's a valid value for that type, it's gonna try to convert it automatically for you. So let's take a look at the third expression. So basically here we have C complex 128 and here we have a value. So basically here 
first the expression is evaluated and the conversion by syntax is done first. So basically it's gonna take this five, it's gonna convert it to float 64 then add it to this type, which is also float 64 and the end result is gonna be a float 64. Then it's gonna take this float 64 and convert it to complex 128. So basically these are the two implicit type conversions which are done automatically by the compiler for you. So another property of constants in Go is kind promotion. And don't be scared by that notion because I'm gonna show you an example and it's really that simple. It's actually very related to what we talked about earlier about implicit type conversion and specifically to conversion by syntax. When you have a specific expression and we give it to the compiler, now the compiler has to understand which is the type which is gonna be the end result type for that expression. So how does it do? It basically does it very simple. It has a table of priority. So pay attention in this slide, I actually numbered the priority of the types. As you can see, the integer type has the least priority and the custom type has the biggest priority. I mean, this schema looks complicated and boring and it doesn't have to be this way. So let me go ahead and show you an example of that to prove you that this is actually very simple to understand. So again, if you open up your IDE, you have constants and then you have kind promotion. So basically, if you open up main.go, here you have a very, very simple program. However, you have to understand the order which I showed you before. So the order of the types inside an expression when declaring a constant doesn't really matter. The priority is still gonna be the same and Go is gonna give the final result still the same. So let's go ahead and have a look at this example. So basically you have a type T. Basically here's how you declare a custom type in Go. You say type T is gonna be complex 128. And then you have const T of type T equals to one. I know this is very confusing. It's really not, it's really as simple as it is. And then you have N equals to this expression. And I know this is weird, but if you pay attention here, I said custom type has the biggest priority and integer has the least priority. So let me go ahead and run this program and actually show you that the type is gonna be the custom type. So as you can see here, we say percent %t n. And what we do here is basically print the type of that constant. And we already know an integer has the lower priority and then follows the float and then follows the complex 128 and then follows the string and then follows the custom type. So custom type has the biggest priority. And if you have at least one custom type in that expression, we already know the end result. We know the end type which Go compiler is gonna assign to that constant. So I know last example may have been very confusing to you because I'm not that good at explaining bubbles and theory inside the code because that's the code. That's how things work actually. So that's why let me go ahead and show you a diagram of the same example so that you can understand it better. So basically you have an example just like before. You have a custom type declaration and then you have some const declarations and you have an expression from those const declarations. And you wanna find out what is the final type of that expression? What is the final type of those constants? So if you take a look at that expression from the const and you have the following types, you have an int, you have a t, you have int32, float64, and you have complex128. So these are the types which are contained in that expression. Next, you have the priority list on the right, which I talked about earlier. So the first step the Go compiler has to do when analyzing your expression, it has to select the type of the highest priority. And that is pretty simple because, well, we have a custom type there, right? Now that the compiler has analyzed your expression, it has figured out which is the type of the highest priority, it has to convert the rest of the types to the type of the highest priority. So that is the second step. After the second step is done, the process is pretty much simple. Just apply the operation between those types and voila, you have the end result, you have the end type which is main.t in this case. So now you have an example which is very similar to what I've showed you before, so don't you think you're not gonna work with me in this tutorial. So take some time, take five to 10 seconds to think about it and then come back with an answer. So it's really nothing fancy. If you follow the previous diagram, it's as simple as that. So basically it's gonna output main.t and in 32 Why main.t? Well, because in that expression we have a custom type and custom type has the highest priority. Thus, the resulting type is gonna be main.t. Well, because that's the custom type which we had in the expression. And then we have in 32 because as I said before, if you have a shift as an operation between two operands, the end result is gonna be an integer. So basically it's gonna be main.t and in 32. All right guys, that's pretty much it on this tutorial and that's pretty much it on constants. I hope you learned something and you had a lot of fun. So if you like this video, make sure to put a thumbs up. If you didn't like this video, make sure to smash that button 
and make sure to check the description of this video because everything that I used in this video starting from the presentation, the code, the resources, the feedback links, social media, everything is there. So make sure to check out the description of this video for more information. And also for feedback and for your comments, make sure to leave your comment, make sure to tell me what sucked in this video or make sure to leave a positive and constructive feedback. So I'll see you in the next tutorial.